Okay, I'm happy. Um, and on behalf of my department, I want to welcome you. I want to actually give you a warm welcome on this January evening to our uh, Alternatives to Suicide Mutual Support Group's overview. Uh, we want to get started quickly, but if I can um, mention a few details and say some words before we do, uh, just on some practical matters. We are scheduled to go to 8.30. We're starting a bit late to let people get here. So hopefully it's, over, it's okay with everyone if we, if we go a little late. Um, we do have to be out of the library by 9 o'clock. We'll go a little past 8.30 and I think that'll work for everybody. Our presenters will be taking a break about halfway through, um, give or take, so that's a little bit after 7 o'clock. Uh, the library cafe will still be open at that time. It's open until 8. The restrooms are on the first floor. So uh, right off the stairs, or if you take the elevators, uh, elevator that's straight ahead and to your left. And, um, and those are practical details. Um, so we are here tonight to talk about the issue of suicide, which, um, of course, uh, is a devastatingly painful and persistent issue on which we have not made nearly uh, as much inroads as, as we'd like to. Um, and therefore, this issue cries out for evolving approaches. And I'm honored to bring uh, an innovative approach that I'm tremendously impressed with, the alternatives to suicide approach. Um, Tonight's introductory event is part of a plan to bring alternative suicide groups to Westchester uh, later this year. And I'll speak a bit more about that just following the break. And we're looking forward to alternatives to suicide coming on as a very highly valued complement to our community's existing network of resources. On a personal note, as someone who has struggled with this issue, um, I never felt more at home discussing this issue than I did when I took a three-day facilitator's training. Um, you, I don't expect everyone in this room to go with everything, uh, every element that Alternatives to Suicide is about, but what I'm fairly certain about is that this is going to be a refreshingly new approach for us. Um, it means a great deal to me. Uh, it's meant a great deal to me when I've had the opportunity to participate in these groups, and I look forward to bringing it to the community so uh, we can have a, uh, you all can have a similar experience. And with that, uh, if you'd please join me in welcoming tonight's presenters from the Western Massachusetts Recovery Learning Community. It is Sarah Davidow and it is Caroline Mazel Carlton. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, and we just want to thank everyone who joined us here tonight, who's spending their Wednesday night in community, um, grappling with an issue um, that can bring up big emotions. Um, looking at an issue in the way it's impacted us personally and envisioning new ways forward for our community. So thank you for spending your evening with us. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to center us in, in space. Um, so the land that we are in right now, north of the island of Manhattan, we would just like to honor that we are in the ancestral land of the Lenape people. Um, so we want to pay our respects um, to the Lene, Lenape people um, and honor their elders, past, present, and emerging. And we'll talk more during the course of this presentation why this process of decolonization, um, examining languages and history, is very relevant um, to this topic of suicide. Um, I'm going to turn it over first to Sarah, though now, um, to share a little bit about the land that we come from and some of her story. Thanks, Caroline. So, actually, before I... Sorry. Hopefully that will not be happening. So, before I start with a little bit of my story, I actually just want to say that 
When we come together for facilitator trainings, we actually have facilitator trainings for the groups, and we also have a two-day training for family providers, et cetera. So we have, we have these trainings quite a bit with different groups of people. And we recognize that when we have these trainings, people are coming into the room all in different places with different experiences and different beliefs as they relate to suicide. And so one of the things that we start with is an exercise that gets at just what are you bringing to you into the room in terms of your beliefs, where this sits with you, what comes up for you when you're asked different questions that relate to suicide. We're not going to do that tonight. There's way too much to many of us and we don't have the time. But I want to honor that we're all probably coming from at least somewhat different places and, and different beliefs and different experiences and that this might challenge some of that. What we're going to offer might feel challenging to people. And I just want to say that hopefully that can be okay, that we can be okay in this room together considering different ideas. And sometimes one of the criticisms that we get is that we're not presenting all sides. That's true. We're not going to present all sides because it's called alternatives. And so we feel like probably a lot of you have heard some of the other sides quite a bit. And we're going to be talking about, if we want to create alternatives, what does that look like? So just hopefully, as if you find yourself having feelings about something we're saying, please feel free when we get to questions to ask about it, but also hopefully challenge yourself to stay present and just say, like, why are we together here? Why are we here together talking about these alternatives and how do we move forward together? So with that, I do want to share a little bit of my story. Caroline will do that a little bit later. Now, I guess what I want to say is when I was a kid, for as far back as I can remember, I think I've always felt different somehow. And the way that difference worked for me wasn't necessarily bad initially. But one of the ways I describe it is kind of like bubbles. So you know when you see kids, or, or adults for that matter, blowing bubbles, sometimes there's that extra little bubble that's attached to the big bubble. You've all seen that? Yeah. I kind of felt like I was in that attached bubble. Like I could see everybody else. I could kind of interact with them. I felt like I was sort of in the same place. And yet I wasn't. I was somehow separate. And that didn't necessarily feel bad to me as a very young kid, but I noticed it. And then, as I got older, right around the time that, honestly, my body started to change, it stopped somehow feeling okay. And there's a lot of reasons, you know, I don't have enough time to get into, you know, every step of the way, every year that I grew up, what was happening, but a lot of things had happened, and it didn't feel okay that my body was changing, that some of the things that were going on in my home were going on, and I started to think about, like, why am I here? I don't know if I want to be here. How do I stay here? And that got harder as I became a teenager, as you can imagine. I think being a teenager is hard no matter what. And this is a point where I just want to say that a number of things could have happened to me. I was about 15, and a number of things could have happened to me. I was thinking about dying. I had started to hurt myself, cutting and burning myself. It was a lot of trouble at home. Things weren't going well. I would stopped going to classes. A lot of things could have happened. I think privilege changed my path, and I always try to name that. When I say that, what do I mean? I, say, I mean, well, I grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut. I bet some of you are familiar with Greenwich, Connecticut. There's money in Greenwich, Connecticut. My family had money. I had the privilege of that. I'm also about as white as it gets, right? And I also had privilege in that. And so where some other people might have ended up in the foster care system if people were paying more attention to what was going on in my home, or I might have ended up in the mental health system much sooner than I did if people had been paying attention to what was happening with me. Instead, what happened was that my mother called an educational consultant. I don't know if you know what an educational consultant is, but it boils down to this. An educational consultant is someone you pay a lot of money to to pull strings with people they know to get you into another place. And my mom thought that the educational consultant was going to get me into a boarding school that would fix me somehow. Instead, the educational consultant said, hey, but how about early college? I said, oh, I'm willing to consider that. I'm willing to consider that. And so 11 days after I turned 16, I found myself at Simons Rock College in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And I was so happy because it was the first time that I was out of my house. 
And I was so terrified. This was the first time that I was out of my house. And it started this cycle in me of running and hiding and running and hiding. That was kind of my first run. I thought, okay, everything will be better now. And it kind of was for a little bit. It felt better. I was in a new place. I had a fresh start. And then suddenly, I was thinking about dying again. I was thinking this isn't working again. I remember one night, I didn't have an idea of how to kill myself just directly, but I thought maybe if I went out in this ice storm and just drove really recklessly, I would end up dying, it would just happen. And then my car spun out and I got scared and I went back, and so it didn't happen at that point, but I did know that something needed to change. And so I pulled on those educational consultant strings again, and that educational consultant, after all the deadlines had passed for transfer, she got me into Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. Now, something really important happened at that point, which was that one friend that I had had at Simon's Rock College, who I'd been really close with, we had spent all this time driving together, and I knew all these things about him. I knew that his favorite song was Lady in Red, and I knew that back in high school he had a crush on the girl who was first violin, who was third violin. He ended up picking up a gun, and he went around the campus and he killed two people, a professor and then a boy who was in my entering class of 23 students. Now, why do I tell you that? I know that's hard to hear. I tell you that not just because it was really upsetting for what it was, but also because I had already learned that the people who had been chosen for me, my family, were not to be trusted. And now what I learned from that situation was the people I chose were not to be trusted. And I felt less and less like I had any place, any way of being safe in this world. And I started, when I started leaving my house, I started believing that I knew what people were saying about me, what they were thinking about me. I wasn't quite hearing their voices, but I believed that I just knew what they were thinking. And it was things like, you don't deserve to be here. You're too ugly to be seen. You need to apologize for me having to look at you, those sorts of things. And I'm not quite sure, honestly, how I survived that time, other than I decided to move again. I thought that was, again, the solution, and I moved to Florida. <laughs> Why? I don't know. I knew someone there. It seemed like a good idea at the time. So now I'm in Florida, and I meet my second therapist. My second therapist, and I, you know, I, I skipped, actually, I'll just back up for one second, my first therapist. I'm going to talk, when we get a little further down, I'm going to talk about this idea of chemical imbalance some more, but my first therapist had said, you have major depression, a chemical imbalance is going to be, it's going to be with you forever. And at that time, that felt like a really great answer because it was an answer, an answer I didn't have. But things kept getting harder, right? So now I'm with a second therapist in Florida. I'm like, all right, now you give me the answer because the first answer didn't work. And what she did was she picked up this book and she asked me all these questions. The questions went something like this. How many people are you having sex with? Are you having safe sex? Why are you having sex with that person? How many drinks are you having? When you drink, how many, you know, how many times a week are you drinking? When you hurt yourself, how are you hurting yourself? How often are you hurting yourself? Why are you doing that? And when she put the book down, what she said was, okay, you are major depression, generalized anxiety disorder, bipolar, and borderline personality disorder. And I don't know how you feel about swearing, but it was at that point that I said, fuck you. <laughs> Except, I didn't say it out loud. I just said it in my head. It was a turning point for me that maybe I wasn't getting the answers I needed by going into the system and asking for them. But I just said it to myself. And what that meant was that they still continued about their way. And when they give those diagnoses, part of it is that they decide what to do with you. And that what they do with you is more psychiatric drugs, more therapy, and hospitalize you when you do the scary things like cutting and burning, which I was doing a whole bunch at that point in my life. Now, that also led to my first hospitalization against my will. However, if you look at my file, please don't look at my file, but if you ever look at my file, <laughs> what you'll see is that it's listed as voluntary. This will probably sound familiar to some of you. But here's how it went. You have a choice. Your choice is to go voluntarily into the hospital, or if you refuse, we will force you to go to the hospital. <laughs> what do you want to do? And even at that point, I knew, even at that point, I knew 
it would be a much less violent way to get to the hospital to just say, okay, I'll go. And so I went. They didn't ask me any questions. They didn't even ask me, like, why are you cutting and burning yourself? Why are you doing these things? And I could have told them. I could have said, maybe not as articulately as I'm about to, but I could have said, you know, sometimes I feel so far out of my body that I'm looking down at myself. And when I hurt myself, it helps ground me. And in this world where I've experienced all this pain that I can't control, here's a pain that I can control, and that's a release. And by the way, although you're hospitalizing me because you believe that when I cut and burn myself, it's a step towards suicide, it's actually the only way I've figured out to stay alive. And you've taken it away from me. But I didn't say that. I got out. And really what I learned was don't talk to anybody about these things. Don't talk to anybody. And what ended up happening was I used my privilege again because, you know, what's a good idea when a system gets to know you a little too well and they're doing things to you that you don't want them to do? move. And I had the resources to move. So I moved back to Massachusetts and I learned not to tell. And so I did something else that a lot of people do when they're still trying to figure themselves out, and this was before there were a lot of peer roles. I promise you a lot of people do this. They enter the mental health system as an employee in the clinical system, and that's what I did. Now I did that very successfully. But what it required of me was this part of my life where I was going to work to seem totally fine and then to go home and fall apart and continue struggling with all the things I was struggling with. It required a lot of energy to keep those two parts separate. And I kept it up, actually, for years. I was very successful. I got promoted. I got lots of praise for doing clinical work as someone who had no clinical degree. And I was also given a lot of space to do it in creative ways because, you know, when you have that credibility of being a non-quote-unquote crazy person and they don't pay attention too much, they just think, oh, you're doing good over there, we can go over here. And then I had a lot of things happen all at the same time that were really hard. I got pregnant, very unexpectedly, another story for another time. And my house, because what would you do when you were a Greenwich girl who gets pregnant? Will you get a house? My house when my son was three weeks old, the pipes froze and everything fell apart. I didn't have that much energy. Not enough energy for an infant, and a house that fell apart, and the job, and everything. So I ended up taking leave, and I came out with another coworker. We started sharing our story. We thought it was the right time. Within days of my story being on the internet, the same people who had employed me and praised me for years called me and questioned whether or not I was competent to return to my role. And that's also a story for another time, but I will say, I ended up losing that job. It took a little bit of time. I did go back for a little while, but I had lost all my credibility. They were now scrutinizing everything I was doing, and nothing was the same. It just wasn't working anymore, and I ended up getting fired. And that, however, was another turning point, a really important turning point, because it was the same time that the recovery learning communities were being visioned. Now, the recovery learning community is where we are coming to you from, and I want to talk a little bit about that because it was big for me. It's not like it's so perfect and it fixed everything, but what it did for me was it gave me an opportunity to be my whole self all at the same time. I could be someone who struggled sometimes. I could be someone who'd overcome all sorts of things. I could be someone who had lots of things to offer and lots of things to do and lots of things to be a part of changing. I could be all of those things all in one person and not spend all my energy hiding and keeping separate. And that was really important for me, because what I learned more than anything else is when you're not wasting your energy hiding all that stuff, you can get a lot more done. So with that, I just want to transition to telling you briefly a little bit about the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community before we get into Alternatives to Suicide, because the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community is where Alternatives to Suicide was developed. Now, I'm not a big fan of reading slides to people, but I'm going to read this to you, because it's our mission statement. So, what this says is the Western Mass RLC supports healing and empowerment for our broader communities and people who have been impacted by psychiatric diagnosis, trauma, extreme states, homelessness, addiction, and other life interrupting challenges through peer-to-peer -peer support and genuine human relationships, alternative healing practices, learning opportunities, and advocacy, essential to our work 
is recognizing and undoing systemic injustices such as racism, sexism, transphobia, and psychiatric oppression. Now, this was not our starting mission statement. Our starting mission statement was something much more basic about peer support and networking, and that was great, but it didn't really represent all that we were and all that we wanted to be. Now, what changed? We changed the top part from just focusing on people with psychiatric diagnoses to recognizing that we are people who have many things that we have gone through, many things that we are going through, and that we're a much richer community. If we recognize that you know, it's like not one struggle per person, we don't live in these weird boxes, and we can be open to all people who are struggling. The next piece was to move from just focusing on peer support to focusing on those four parts that you see up there. Now, I don't have time to get into what is held by each of those four parts, but I will just say, in the peer support part, we have many pieces. We have a peer respite. I know there are peer respites in New York State. We have hearing voices groups. We have many hearing voices groups. You actually, I think there's some hearing voices information on the back table. We have people who go into hospitals and support people to come back out. It's where our alternatives to suicide groups sit, and many other pieces as well. Our alternative healing practices are mainly about creating access to people who wouldn't otherwise have access to things like yoga, Reiki, acupuncture, sound healing, all sorts of different things. Not because we think that's the new answer for everyone, but because we think that it's important for people to have choice. And that sometimes those things are very powerful for people. We have advocacy piece, which is sometimes individual advocacy, like going to an appointment with somebody, but it's also national advocacy, statewide advocacy, sometimes even international <coughs> advocacy that focuses on changing the world, because that's really what we want to do. And because we know that some people have been taught that they can't ask why or say no anymore, and that regaining that ability to say no and realizing that you don't even have to say it alone, you can stand and protest with whole groups of people and be a part of a community can be life-changing for people. And then the learning piece, well, that's what brings us here. That's what brings us all over the country for hearing voices trainings as well, and many other pieces. We have films, we have books. Check us out if you want to learn more about that. And that last piece about social justice and oppression, you know, we have been told many reasons why we struggle. We've been told many reasons, and we're going to talk more about that tonight. But what's become really clear to us over time that much of our struggle comes from the world that we're trying to survive. It comes from the systemic oppression that many of us have experienced in different ways, as women, as people of color, as trans people, and so on. And that has led a lot of us to have trouble existing in this world in different ways. And that that's important to put up front. It's important to recognize its core to our community and what we're trying to do. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Caroline. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, so probably a lot of you are here um, because you know uh, suicide rates in our country have reached an all-time high. Um, they continue to rise despite millions of dollars being invested in suicide prevention efforts. So in times such as these, sometimes it's really important to take a moment to take stock about what our current approaches are. Um, certainly alternatives to suicide approach represents an alternative to, to the dominant paradigm. Um, but we want to talk about why. We want to look at some of these pieces that are characteristic of current approaches and sort of one by one um, take a look at them um, and see how they're working and how we might shift things to make them more effective. So I know for me, um, in my personal experience, receiving mental health services, and maybe there's a lot of other folks um, in this room who have had this experience where you're sitting and you're having a dialogue with someone. Um, maybe it's not even in the mental health system, but maybe in a college counseling center. Um, you're having a conversation about struggles in your life, various problems, Maybe it's a relationship, um, a financial struggle, a struggle with housing, 
Um, you're having a conversation about these different issues, and then the topic of suicide arises. Maybe you say, sometimes I think, you know, this is so hard that maybe I don't want to be here anymore. And perhaps you may have, as I have felt, noticed this palpable shift in that conversation, where all of a sudden you, were, you went from having a dialogue um, to more of an assessment. Um, sometimes maybe you have the experience where someone actually brings out um, a risk assessment tool and starts asking you sort of this canned list of questions one by one. Does anyone have any examples of what those questions are? Do you have support from the community? Sometimes. Um, the one, one that I've heard the most of is, do you have a plan? Like, is that familiar to people? Yeah. Do you have a plan? Do you have the means to carry it out? Are they lethal means? Um, and they tend to come kind of right in a row. Um, and the reason is, it is, it is a tool, it's a format, um, a risk assessment tool. And maybe you've also seen the safety contracts um, that might come afterwards. Like, can you sign this sort of legalistic document um, saying that you won't try to end your life? And for me, and for hundreds of other people that I've spoke to, this can be so disconnecting. This can feel so humiliating, like to go from a conversation to this list of questions off a of paper. Um, yet people continue, you know, this is one of the, the go-to approaches, um, clinical risk assessment tools. And when we go to conferences like the American Association of Suicidology in this country, you will see many, many papers as people continue to develop and refine these types of clinical risk assessment tools. Um, you'll also find, when, if you attend suicidology conferences, um, how effective they are. Um, does anyone know how effective the most refined clinical risk assessment tool we have is in 2019? Well, it hovers about in the 50%, 50%. But what that means is I could take a quarter out of my pocket here and flip it, and it would be about as refined of a risk as refined tool for predicting human behavior um, than, than what we have available to us in clinical risk assessment. Um, so a lot of people, you know, clearly this, this isn't effective. Um, and we have data, this is from a medical journal in Australia. People say, hey, we know. We know it doesn't work. We know that we're terrible at being able to predict human behavior. Um, but despite the inadvocacy, and despite the fact that many folks with lived experience talk about the feelings of disconnection, um, <coughs> risk assessment tools continue to be used. Um, real quick question. Yeah, how can you determine the um, effectiveness of the tool? Either the patient doesn't kill himself or does, but if the tool is effective, you prevent them from killing themselves, but you don't know if they would have if they did. So how do you even... Yeah, so just, just by basic outcomes. Like, did this person, most of the reviews are like, did this person go on to, that we predicted, did they go on to take their life or not? Um, I, I don't I don't want to get super bogged down here. Um, is there a question? Yeah. Ask, if someone does ask a question, can you repeat it so the rest of us? Can yeah. Ask. So people are asking like for this like Journal of American, um, sorry, this Australian Medical Journal. How do people get a sense of clinical risk assessment like effectiveness? Um, and so there have been studies like reviewing, you know, how how like if a person um, the prediction, like, did they then go on to end their life or not? Um, so clinical risk assessments, like when you attend suicidology conferences, you hear over and over. They don't really work, um, but we continue to use them. They don't really work. You know, many times we have folks that we did a risk assessment on and then immediately, you know, go on to end their lives. So why do people continue to use them? 
um, if we know that they're not great predictors of human behavior. Um, one of the things that you hear most often is um, if we don't use these risk assessment tools, then we may be held liable in the event of someone's death by suicide. So they know they're not effective, they know they're disconnecting, but there's concerns about liability. Um, so when we have a whole system that's based on you know, a certain type of fear, um, it's good to evaluate that. Um, and so we've had, um, we had an attorney um, in this movement, Susan Steppen, um, who did a comprehensive review of court cases regarding liability and suicide um, to figure out what is the risk um, of someone you know, being held, you know, being taken to court um, or losing a license um, over this event happening. Um, in a comprehensive review of court cases in this country, um, what Susan Stepman found was that the risk of a non-prescribing outpatient clinician being held liable in the event of someone's death by suicide is about the same as being struck by lightning. Um, so it's incredibly, incredibly rare. It's rare that the cases are brought, um, and it's even rarer that you know the court will rule, um, you know, against the plaintiff and say you are you are liable in the event of this death. Um, so these cases are incredibly rare. Psychiatrists have a slightly elevated risk, particularly if they're prescribing um, black, box, black box medications. But still, these cases continue to be very rare. Um, so in terms of um, peer support groups, you know, we're talking, um, we're gonna be talking a lot later about alternatives to suicide groups themselves. What is sort of the liability risk? Um, well, in review of, you know, case law in the United States, um, it's definitely not as high as, like, being struck by lightning. Um, it's not even as high as an asteroid hitting the Earth, because asteroids have literally hit the Earth before. Um, but there's never been a case um, in the United States or, or the globe um, where someone in a peer support group or peer support role has been held liable for someone's death by suicide. Um, it just has never happened. And people have searched, you know, the, you know, the legal records. Um, the closest people can come to a case is that someone at one point brought a case against Alcoholics Anonymous. It was not um, for, uh, there were, it did not have anything to do with suicide though. Um, someone was tragically killed by someone that she had met in an Alcoholics Anonymous group. Um, and the family you know, took AA to court and was like, you know, this terrible tragedy, like who is responsible? Um, but the court ruled that AA couldn't be held responsible um, for this tragedy. Um, so, what are we really shifting around? Um, this paradigm of risk assessment. Um, not just in suicide, but kind of across the board. We're really, really bad at predicting other people's behavior. Sometimes we're just bad at predicting what we're even going to do. So in the alternatives to suicide approach, we let that go. We know we can't really predict if. So instead of spending all this time on figuring out who's actually going to die by suicide, our focus is on talking about why they want to die in the first place, um, listening to someone's stories, instead of just a canned list of questions, really exploring what's going on in your life. Is there something you're trying to get away from? Is there something that you need? And also really powerful are the questions of, of why not? Um, so I talk to people, you know, all the time, every week, um, that have been grappling with thoughts of suicide very long term. And sometimes the most powerful thing to ask is, you know, any day you, you could have gotten up and made that choice to end your life, but you didn't. Um, so what's kept you here? 
And there are such powerful conversations about meaning and purpose and relationship that flow out of this place of why not, too. But we will never, never get there if we're just focusing on, you know, a canned list of protocol questions um, and then a safety contract. So we're going to talk a little bit about pathology and this idea that people who think about killing themselves are sick or quote unquote mentally ill. But before we get there, I just want to say that there was recently, actually at our most recent alternatives to suicide facilitator training, someone after Caroline talked about this kind of piece, oh goodness, uh, she asked, well, I don't get it. Why is liability higher for people who do this thing that we've proven doesn't work? Why wouldn't liability be higher if they continue to do the thing that we have proven, this assessment that doesn't work? And I know someone asked, you know, how do we know the assessment doesn't work? I would suggest that we, if we had more time, we can get into lots of the details of that. If you Google it, though, I promise you the research is, there's a great deal of research out there, and it's consistent. All of it says it doesn't work. And in fact, there's a quote that I've started to use by, I think he's a Harvard professor who did a bunch of research. He said, I'm not going to get it exactly right, but he said something like, we have studied and studied and studied the efficacy of suicide assessments, and it's really embarrassing to report that it's completely ineffective. It's like flipping a coin. How humiliating is that? But, dot, 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 we should continue to use it because, I don't know, really great minds thought of it, so there must be some use. That's like, all right, not literally what he said word for word, but that is basically what he said. And actually, we've been writing some chapters, soon to be published, we hope, on, on suicide, and, and some books that will be coming out soon where we use that quote, because it's so powerful. And basically what it tells us is, liability is not necessarily determined by what works, but by what is the belief of the society at that time you know, what is the dominant paradigm? What do people think should be done, regardless of whether or not it works? It just seems to be the reality of it. Now, we're going to talk about this pathology thing. And I just want to say before I get into it, we are going to challenge the medical way of looking at things. Now, that doesn't mean that what we're saying is we need to get rid of the option of looking at things as a, a quote-unquote mental illness. What we are saying is that when we're told that this is what we know, that we know what's wrong with you, we know why you have this issue, and we know how to fix it, and we know how that fix works, we're saying that actually that's not entirely true. But even if that's not entirely true, it doesn't mean that we need to take all those things off as an option. What we're actually saying is we want to broaden the options. So it's not about taking the medical model out of the picture. So if you're someone for whom diagnosis and the medical model is very important, and you get to hang on to that. We're not going to try and take it away from you. But we are saying, if we could take that from the only thing that people hear to one of the many things that people hear and give them the power to figure out what makes sense and works for them, that in our experience, that is much more effective and also just more just. But let's, to get there, we do need to challenge some of the ideas that the medical model is sometimes offered with. That, you know, again, just this black and white, this is the thing that we know. And so we're going to challenge that now. And if you find yourself challenged by it, just breathe with us. So you're going to notice that there's some pills up here. Now, what's written on the pills you may or may not be able to see are words like beauty and truth and dreams and hope. And what we've learned in doing alternatives to suicide groups and much of our other work as well is that that's often what people are looking for when they're in distress and they go for help, but the pills are usually not what brings the beauty and the dreams and the hope. And there's a confusion there. Now, there's also a confusion in this loop. Now, this image comes out of an article that I wrote that you will find on maddenamerica.com. If you've never checked out maddenamerica.com, it's an interesting place. It has psychologists and psychiatrists and family members and people who've been in the system themselves all sharing their knowledge and their experience in really powerful ways, in my experience. And you'll find lots from me if you want to check it out. And this is one of the articles I wrote. It was called Suicidal Tendencies, Part 1. And my point with this image 
is to say, here's what we're often told when we go. It's certainly what I was told. You're mentally ill. Okay. How do you know I'm mentally ill? Because you're suicidal. Okay. Well, you know, but why does being suicidal, you know, like, what does that tell you? Well, it tells us that you're mentally ill. Okay. But, you know, like, how did we get into this loop that's actually no information? If I'm suicidal because I'm mentally ill, and you know I'm mentally ill because I'm suicidal, what do you actually know? Like, no, nothing. And so what often gets told to us is that, well, you have a chemical imbalance. Okay. Well, do any of you know where the chemical imbalance theory came from? No? Okay. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you sort of a boiled down summary of where it came from. And it will almost sound like it makes sense for a moment. So we have these selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the SSRIs, things like Prozac. And although the research is pretty debatable, it seems to be that some people, when they take these SSRIs, people who are diagnosed with this thing we call depression, sometimes they seem to feel better for at least a period of time. Okay, so what people then said, okay, if the SSRIs are helping people feel better, then it must be that they didn't have enough serotonin. Chemical imbalance. And they did the same thing with the diagnosis of schizophrenia. They said, okay, these people who are diagnosed with this thing that, is called schizo that we call schizophrenia, we know that sometimes when we give them these anti-dopaminergic drug drugs that affect dopamine in the brain, that sometimes they seem to do better for at least a period of time. Some of them, right? Well, that must be because they had too much dopamine in the brain. Therefore, chemical imbalance. That's basically the logic this theory was based on. Now, let me ask you, how many of you are coffee drinkers? Most of you. I am totally not a coffee drinker. I like the smell of it, so I, I might sit next to you, but I don't like to drink it. Now, presumably, if you're a coffee drinker, you might like the effect of the drug caffeine on your body. Right? How many of you think you have discovered caffeine deficiency in yourself? Anybody? Oh, yeah. All right, you're my person. I always wait. There's always one person who raises their hand, so I'm like, wait, who's it going to be? So thank you for being that person. But it's not, it doesn't make as much sense when you put it in those terms, right? And sometimes people have said the same thing about aspirin. Well, just because we know that aspirin sometimes helps people who have headaches, it doesn't mean that headaches are caused by an aspirin deficiency. It doesn't make sense. And yet people have been told over and over and over again that they have a chemical imbalance based on this theory that makes no sense and has been, in fact, disproven. You can find article upon article on the internet saying the chemical imbalance theory has been disproven, and yet people are still hearing it. Now, why? Well, we have some people, like Donald Pies, a psychiatrist, you know, who said, well, it's just kind of an analogy trying to boil it down for people. Yeah, but, no, that's damaging because, you know what happens when you tell someone, well, this is happening to you because you have a chemical imbalance? Does it suggest, oh, now you have lots of choices about what to do with that? No. It suggests, well, it's, it's a handy marketing tool for people who have chemicals that they say will fix it, but it's not a tool that says there's lots of choices. Now, this isn't an argument against psychiatric drugs. I'm not saying throw them all out, and especially not if you find it helpful. But I am saying there's a different way to look at it. Joanna Moncrief is a psychiatrist out of England, and she argues for a drug-focused way rather than a disease-focused way. She says, it's just not true to tell people, we know what's wrong with you, and we know that we have this drug that will help fix it. It's not based on what we know. But it is fair to say, we have this drug that sometimes seems to help people who are going through what you say you're going through. Do you want to try it? That's okay, you can still use it as a tool. People have been using drugs since the beginning of time, in various different ways, right? So we don't need to say no more drugs, but we need to say let's be honest about it, because it, it pushes people in different directions. So I'm just gonna read this quote as well. Up here, it's meaningful. Dr. David Webb is who this quote is from. He was the first person who was a suicide attempt survivor, who then went on to complete complete a uh, PhD in suicidology. And what he has to say here is, although heavily promoted 
by the medical profession and drug companies, there is little scientific evidence to support the claim that depression is a genuine medical illness that causes suicide. The great disaster of this myth is that once the professionals assume that depression is the cause rather than just another symptom, they look no further. It gets in our way of exploring with each other how did we get here. And in these groups, what we have found is that exploring how did we get here often helps us find a path on how do we move through. Now, I do want to also offer something on diagnosis. I'm going to try and do this as quickly as I can. But, you know, we get also told, beyond the chemical imbalance, we get told that, oh, we know these diagnoses are, are these real concrete things, and here, we know what you have. Now, that would be great if people really did know it. I don't know if you've experienced what I've experienced. I, I've experienced something that I call like a diagnosis tail, which means I go to a different doctor, I get a different diagnosis. Does the old diagnosis drop off? Nope, just gets added to the tail. And now I have like more and more and more diagnoses following me around. Does beg the question, do they actually know what's wrong if they all keep giving me different ones? Let's go and look at some of the research real quick as to, you know, is that a phenomenon a lot of people are experiencing? And you go back to the 70s for that. There is a psychologist, David Rosenham. He's no longer alive. He just died a handful of years ago, though. He did a really important study that I usually refer to, often people refer to as the THUD study. Now, this study is focused on the diagnosis of schizophrenia, but we find that it's applicable across many diagnoses. And so here's how it goes. David Rosenham got together with seven other people. There were four other men, three other women. They agreed that they were going to do this study where they were going to go to hospitals and say they were hearing a voice. They went to 12 hospitals in five different states. Among those 12 hospitals were well-funded city hospitals connected to universities, run-down rural hospitals, and one private pay really expensive hospital. Keep that in mind. That will come back in just a minute. Now, as they went to those 12 different hospitals, they were each supposed to say, I am hearing a voice. And the voice was supposed to be saying, thud, hollow, or empty. And then they were supposed to see what happened. In all, on all 12 of those occasions, they got hospitalized. On all 12 of those occasions, they were then supposed to, once hospitalized, go back to how they are in their day-to-day -day lives. No longer hearing voices, just who they are. And these are people who were psychiatrists, pediatricians, psychologists, grad student, a painter, homemaker, just people like all of us. Now, one of them, actually David himself, said, because he was one of the people who did this experiment, he said to his family, don't worry, I'll be back when I'm back, it'll probably be a couple days. If you look at his article, he goes on to say, like, who knew it would be two months? Two months. The shortest day was seven days. The average was 19 days. The longest was 52 days. And that person had to be sprung by the others. Uh, this was in the early 70s. Now, what happened while they were in there was also really interesting. They, as I said, were supposed to just go back to their normal day-to-day, -day, but they were all taking notes, they were paying attention to what was going on, and one of them mysteriously got note-taking behavior in their file. So this tells us that once you have the diagnosis, we see you through this lens, right? Now, not a one of the people in the provider roles, these paid roles who were there to help figure out what was wrong and help them move through it, not one of them realized that they were quote unquote fake patients. You know who did? The other people who were hospitalized. Not all of them, but a number of people said, oh, we think something's going on here. Are you making a movie? Are you a journalist? What's going on? Something's up. But not the people who were paid. <laughs> Now, all of them had to admit that they were quote-unquote mentally ill, accept their diagnosis, and agree to take their psychiatric drugs in order to leave. Eleven of them, or in eleven occasions, they were diagnosed with schizophrenia. On one occasion, a person was diagnosed with manic depression, what we would call bipolar today, and guess which hospital gave them what was seen as the less severe diagnosis of the time? The private pay hospital. So now we start to see how class and money can affect the diagnosis that you get. Now, once they were out, people were not happy. The results were in, the word was out, the hospitals were mad. 
and one hospital that was not involved in the original experiment said, that would never happen here. So David said, okay, let's do another experiment, hospital where this would never happen. He said, let's choose a period of time, and during that period of time, we are going to send you, quote unquote, big patients, all you have to do is catch them. 193 people were seen during that period of time. 41 people were identified as quote unquote fake patients, and other 42 were seen as suspect. Guess how many they sent? Zero. Zero. So when we look at that research, and it's been, you know, replicated, not that study, but other ways of looking at other research has been replicated over time, we see that this thing that we call diagnosis, this thing that people get told is wrong with them, that we know is wrong with you. Ah, you know, maybe, maybe we don't know as much as we're saying that we know. We can also see how this is affected by race and gender and so many other things. Another quick example. So there was some research done with a hospital in Michigan. They looked at the files, and this has definitely been applicable beyond Michigan as well, but just to focus on Michigan for the moment. Before the 1960s, who was most commonly given the diagnosis of schizophrenia? Anybody? Women. Mostly white, middle-class women. Yep. Things that were in their file, reads too much. <laughs> Isn't taking care of her kids. Embarrassed her husbands. Not doing her housework. Then we hit the 1960s. What's happening in the 1960s? I, I, there were lots of different answers, but I heard civil rights out there, absolutely. So lots of things were happening. The civil rights movement was happening. And mysteriously, at that same time, the group that became most commonly diagnosed with schizophrenia, black men. Things that started going in their file were things like paranoid about the cops. <laughs> I mean, we're laughing, but it's not really funny, and it tells us a lot about how this system has intersected with race and class and gender and all, and so many different examples we could give. So I'm gonna stop there, but I just ask that you consider what this means when then we see this research that says, oh, 90% of people who attempt or who kill themselves are mentally ill. What does that mean? What are we saying to people? What are we doing when we narrow in the options for people about what they're experiencing and why? Thank you, Sarah. So we spoke about how suicide rates in this country are on the rise. Um, another statistic that people may have heard before is that folks like me, folks who have a diagnosis of bipolar or schizophrenia, that we tend to die 25 years earlier than those who do not have these diagnoses. I, I heard that a lot over the years. Um, but more recent studies that we look at indicate that that morbidity gap between folks like me with these diagnoses and folks without, um, is actually growing. So it's now closer to 26, 27 years. That morbidity gap is inching wider, um, despite the fact in other areas, you know, such as folks with cancer or HIV, those folks are living much longer than they did in the past. Um, but not so with people who are receiving these diagnoses. Um, so it's become such a crisis that the United Nations, um, in June of 2017, decided to make a statement. Because if we're seeing a morbidity graph that grows, um, it makes sense to extrapolate that there is something about the way that we are defining and treating these conditions that is causing it. Um, so the United Nations very clearly said, we need, we need to shift things. We need to stop focusing so much on chemical imbalances and start looking at power imbalances. So what does that mean? Um, what it means is, you know, folks that have thoughts of suicide, um, folks that struggle, have suicide attempts, there is a context. Um, we don't have a lot of research, as 
Sarah touched on around chemical imbalance. Um, we also, um, another common thing that we started hearing, you know, in the late 20th century was around genetics. That as we mapped the human genome, that we were going to find that folks with these diagnoses, that we have um, genetic differences. And that is why we have these struggles. Those studies have not panned out. So when you look at a gene study, sometimes a gene study will have a really big headline, um, but if you actually look, dive into the abstract, you'll see that you know, the correlation between folks with a certain gene expression is like 2.5%. So they'll study these huge groups of people and they'll be like, oh, 2.5% of folks with the diagnosis of schizophrenia share this particular gene. So very, very small results versus these other studies that we have seen around the impact of trauma. Um, so a study, um, you know, one of the first comprehensive, huge scale, first study, 17,000 people um, looked at folks and just asked basic questions about did these things happen before you turned 18? Did a parent go to jail? Did you ever see your mom hit? Um, did you experience um, sexual abuse? Basic questions. Um, people just answered yes or no. The findings were staggering um, on a whole range of issues, but particularly on suicide. Um, so, it was found that someone that had four adverse childhood experiences um, was 1,200% more likely to have a suicide attempt than someone with zero. Um, and then when it ratcheted up to six, um, that percentage um, was 5,000% more likely. Um, and what I'll offer is, if you are someone who's interested like in research design, um, and one of these studies piques your interest, um, and you want to know more about the design of the study, feel free to email us, um, and we'll provide that information. Um, but for our purposes, it's really key to talk about the context and suicide. Um, so this is what um, the most robust data is actually showing us. Um, that it's not about chemicals, it's not about genes, but it's about experiences. Certainly though, it isn't just limited to what is generally defined as trauma. One of the things that we cannot state enough is that suicide is a social justice issue. Um, so if we are people who are interested um, in decreasing rates of suicide in our community, there is a lot that we need to reckon with. It's not more hospital beds. It's looking at things like income equality. We have the correlations between poverty and isolation um, with rates of suicide. These are deeply connected issues. Um, we have many, many studies that indicate um, that LGBTQ folks um, exhibit much higher rates of suicide um, than those outside of the community. Now what's interesting though, is we have now the first generation of trans children that have been raised with the option of having their gender identity be respected. Um, and what the findings have been, this is maybe shockingly, uh, I think it's kind of like um, obvious, but if a kid is respected, if, if a child's chosen name and pronouns and gender identity are honored, that rates of suicide amongst the population are, are on the level of any other child. So we know um, that creating a more just and equitable society um, in terms of gender identity, um, income, uh, ethnicity, all of this will improve um, rates of suicide. Um, it is connected to these larger systemic issues. Um, 
and uh, the rates of suicide. One of the reasons why we began our presentation today with, with the land acknowledgement is that the, the demographic with the highest rate of suicide in this country, Canada, and Australia are indigenous peoples. Um, so we know having that experience of losing your cultural um, agency, um, losing touch with ancestral practices and language um, can cause rates of suicide to climb. Now, in terms of how we move forward, um, there are many things. Trauma is not this sort of like death sentence. Um, it's not like, oh, I've had these really high um, you know, rates of adverse experiences in my life um, that you know, things are gonna be forever really difficult for me. There are many, many evidence-based practices for trauma out there. Um, it's just that pharmaceutical products are not one of them. They're not shown our first line defense for people that are struggling, which is usually a medication, is not shown to be effective in mitigating the effects of trauma. However, there's many, many things that are, and we hope that people will start to learn more about these approaches, like neurofeedback, yoga, EMDR, um, and also um, having groups where people can come about what's happened to them in their lives without judgment, to express their feelings and be held in community. Like you'll find that alternatives to suicide groups are also shown to help mitigate some of these painful events in our lives that lead people um, to consider suicide. One last thing that we want to mention too is a really interesting study. So we talked about how indigenous groups experience this very high rate of suicide. Um, and so it raised concerns with a lot of people. Um, you know, a lot of well-intentioned people said, hey, what we need to do is send more clinicians, um, have more pharmaceuticals available, have more access to traditional mental health services for folks in these native communities. But it did not change rates of suicide at all. There was no improvement. Um, the recent studies out of Canada show that in communities where people are learning to reclaim some of their native language, some of their agency, some of their spiritual practices, that it is then that rates of suicide begin to drop. So much so that in communities where 50% um, can converse in their native language and have some awarenesses of these practices, the suicide rate is drops almost to zero. So it actually becomes lower than non-native communities. Um, so this is something that we have been looking at a lot. And when we train our alternatives to suicide facilitators, there is a lot a focus on language. Instead of just using sort of clinical language, I'm um, using the language of heart, of spirit, of song, of poetry, of our ancestors to describe what is going on for us and to help us envision new ways forward. Um, so I was really struck one time when we were in Australia doing one of these trainings and a woman um, from the Aboriginal community, she was a Wajuk Nanyar woman, um, one of a civilization that's thousands of years old, one of the oldest on the planet. And she said, you know, we have these practices like sound healing, circle process, herb. I can't get funding for them because I'm told they're not evidence-based. Um, so I think there is something wrong in a world where we're defining what a healer is for people instead of listening to them um, and honoring and reclaiming some of these traditions um, that are found to really improve people's lives. So part of just to, to wrap this section up, 
part of what we talk a lot about in groups and the trainings, what we just hope you will consider is that recognizing trauma is a way of preventing us from replicating things like silencing people, that loss of power that people experience when they lose their voice, and these extreme power differentials that operate in our system that I know impacted me deeply, and I hear stories every day about the impact of loss of power that people experience. And one of the things that I'll just mention that is sort of, it's hard for people to grasp sometimes, but one of the powers that people have that they, they try to retain sometimes is the choice to kill themselves. And it's not a choice we want them to make, but I have heard many people at this point, many more than just a few, say, you know what allows me to keep going in this world? The fact that I know that I have this choice to not keep going. It's a kind of a contradiction in its way, but it's really powerful to consider that that choice is part of what helps people keep going. And so these power differentials that disrupt that, that just try and control people, seem to have the opposite of the intended effect, taking away choice and shame as well. These are big things. So by recognizing trauma, by trying to right this, we're trying to move past those things rather than replicating them. So, Another myth that we just want to talk about is the suicide prevention myth. Now, this one often scares people when we tell them alternatives to suicide is not suicide prevention. Now, what do we mean by that? What we mean by that is certainly not that we don't care whether people live or die. We do care, or we wouldn't have invested all this time. What we mean is that what we have seen from suicide prevention is this idea that we need to be responsible for people and that we need to do whatever it takes to keep them alive. And sometimes that whatever it takes can be really harmful to people. And so instead, what we say in alternatives to suicide approach is rather than being responsible for people, can we move to being responsible to each other? To being with each other, to sitting with each other in the darkness, to moving through, to talking through some of our most difficult and dark times. So that's the shift that we're trying to make here. And this, I know it's going to be too small to see, it's also from one of my articles, actually the same one as the earlier one, The Suicidal Tendencies, Part 1. What it's trying to demonstrate is that there are lots of reasons that people say that they're suicidal. Some of them are just, hey, I had nowhere to stay tonight, and the hospital has a bed. Sometimes it's, hey, you know, the system trained me, I need to say this, to get anybody to listen. There's lots of reasons we could go through, and we do go through them in more depth in the training. Sometimes it does actually mean, I'm, I'm really thinking that I can't stay here, that I can't keep living. And if that's the reason, if that's the reason someone's saying that and they're really considering killing themselves, then there's a million reasons why that might be. And that also deserves exploration. It could be that they're grieving and they've lost someone. It could be that they have a medical condition that leaves them in so much pain every single day that they don't know how to survive it. It could be so many different things. But what it's important to recognize that suicide prevention often misses is that suicide is not the problem. Suicide is a solution. It may be a solution that we don't want people to select. And it's a really extreme solution. But if we continue to regard it as the problem, then we don't look any further, like that David Webb quote said earlier. It stops us from actually exploring with each other. It sets us on the wrong path, and we miss what the actual problems are that is driving someone to consider suicide. And a brief story I will share about someone that I spent a lot of time with over the course of a couple of years. This was someone who was told by the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health that I could save them. Okay, so that's usually not a call that's gonna go well. If someone has been told that you are going to save them, then they call you and say, okay, save me now. I'm like, ah, oh, I don't know, I don't know that I can do that. He got quite mad at me. But we continued to stay connected on Facebook and in person. And he really wanted me to know he was going to kill himself. He wanted me to know, and he told me over and over. And I had to make a decision, and I did make that decision because it's what I believe was right to say to him, no matter what you say to me, I'm not going to be the person who calls somebody on you. I'm not going to call the police. I'm not going to call emergency services. I'm going to hear you out. And yet, even with me saying that, we still were in this weird place of, like, I didn't want him to kill himself. 
And so sometimes I would offer these questions or conversations about like, well, what might help you stay here? And he would be like, no, you don't understand. I'm going to kill myself and I have a plan and I'm going to do it. And at some point I actually had to say, okay, I let go of any agenda I have to keep you alive. Instead, what I'm going to say to you now is, I hear you are going to die. Is there anything you want to do before you die? And when I asked him that, it changed the whole conversation. And he said, yeah. I want to create this art show with my photography. I have all these photographs. Let's talk about these photographs. And let's talk about the other photographs I want to take and the places I want to go to take them and how I want to put this together and how you can help me. We talked about that. That conversation went on for a couple of weeks. By the end of that conversation, he didn't want to kill himself. Not because I had saved him. Not because I could stop and control him. But because he had, for himself, found a spark in himself and the reason that he wanted to stay here. And that required me letting go of any agenda I had to make him stay alive. Now, ultimately what we say is that instead of the suicide prevention thing, instead of just trying to control someone for as long as I can see you and keep you alive, how about instead we move to an approach where we support you to want to be here yourself? And that is the aim of Alternatives to Suicide and why we say that we really aren't so connected with the suicide prevention. In fact, not killing yourself becomes a side effect of that. And actually, I will share, people always ask us, they always want to know, okay, how many people? How many people have killed themselves who have been connected to alternatives to suicide groups? It's a question that comes up all the time. I'll tell you, we are aware of, after a decade of groups, and hundreds upon hundreds of people, we're aware of two people who've died by suicide. And both of those people moved out of the area where there weren't groups being held. And also, both of those people were people in clinical roles in the mental health system who had even more pressure on them to not talk about what they were going through. Mm -hmm. So I offer you that as food for thought. Thanks, Sarah. I'm just going to say like how much I, I appreciate this graphic about the diversity um, of topics that arise when, when we're talking about suicide um, over the past close to seven years of facilitating these groups, it has always been amazing to me all the many, many different things that we grapple with, um, from crises of meaning, to, to housing, to have people that were immigrants, um, wondering where, where do I go now um, in an America that feels ever more unfriendly to immigrants. Our conversations have been incredibly diverse and meaningful. Um, but there is one thing that I do hear a lot facilitating these groups. Um, one of the things I hear probably every month um, is something to the effect of, I haven't talked about these thoughts in years. I haven't talked about these thoughts in months. I haven't talked about these thoughts since, you know, someone called the police to do a wellness check and they busted down my door. I haven't talked about these thoughts since the time I brought it up at school and I got kicked out of my university, had to take a forced medical leave. I haven't talked about these thoughts since the time, you know, they took my shoes and belt at the hospital. But what I never hear, what I've never heard over the years is anyone who's ever said, I stopped thinking these thoughts. I stopped thinking these thoughts when the police came to my door. I stopped thinking these thoughts when I was involuntarily committed. I've never heard it. All I've heard is that people have been moved to silence. They've learned to say what they need to say to hide the depth of their pain. Um, and that's very concerning to me that we're, start, we're creating these conditions of silence with some of our frontline approaches of, you know, involuntarily hospitalizing people who bring up the topic. So that's pretty serious. 
Um, so we should probably look very closely at um, you know, whether acute hospitalization itself works. Now I hear it's leaving a lot of people silent, but is it effective for actually reducing rates of suicide? The answer is a resounding no. Not only is acute hospitalization ineffective for reducing rates of suicide, what has been found in study after study after study is that rates of suicide actually increase during hospitalization. Rates of suicide actually increase in uh, the time periods following an acute hospitalization. So this is just one study, but um, the Journal of American Medicine did a meta-analysis. So hundreds and hundreds of these studies have been done the world over. Um, and in the most um, recent meta-analysis, which just means they looked at a ton of studies, um, their conclusion um, from the psychiatric journal is, the immediate post-discharge period is a time of marked risk, but rates of suicide remain high for many years after discharge. Um, so, you know, if we if we leave this gathering, you know, with anything, um, I would like us to look really closely at this. Now, when I attend different conferences, researchers are well aware of this. This is very documented. This effect. Um, and they always say, we're working on it. We're trying to figure out you know, what, what it is about acute hospitalization. We want to fix it. Um, but I think you know, for people who are really looking for change and are looking for change now, we need to start looking for alternatives to this risk assessment to hospitalization feedback loop that people can, can get stuck in and then they learn to be silent to get out of that loop, but they never address the root issues. But as Sarah said, you know, suicide itself isn't the problem. We need to provide the space and in, in community to grapple with the real issues. Um, so what we're gonna do now is take a break. Um, it's a lot of information um, but we hope people now understand why we need to shift what we're doing, but also the ways in which we're hoping to shift it. We'll take a 10 minute break, and then we're gonna come back um, and talk more about what we're doing in our community and these groups.